My name is Patrick Stahl. I'm an engineer with Bobcat. Just a little bit about Bobcat, uh, owned by Dusan Intracore. I uh, make skid steer loaders, track loaders, excavators, uh, work machines, utility vehicles, and then a, a range of attachments for the various platforms. Uh, just to give you a little bit of warning, um, if you find this boring, it may not be my problem. Um, <clears throat> things don't really translate well to PowerPoint. So the Gettysburg Address, a very famous speech, uh, doesn't really work so well in PowerPoint. So the interesting thing about this project is <clears throat> after the initial um, FEA, uh, this component looked fine. We sent it to our proving grounds, and then we started seeing uh, some unexpected failures. So we had, uh, so we had a uh, limited analysis history on the previous component, no field failures or warranty data on the previous component, and then no well-defined FEA load cases. And when we did do a strain gauge um, prediction, the strain gauge testing or predicted high life. So that, you know, in summary, this failure was unexpected. Uh, what I want to show in this presentation is how we use um, Glyphworks and Design Life together. So Glyphworks is useful for analyzing uh, field and lab data. And where I, I really see the advantage of it is it provides uh, insight into the loading and duty cycle of a component. So it really helps you uh, um, really understand the behavior of, of your component. Design life helps bridge the gap between simulation and test. So in, in FEA, it's usually easy to get a stress result, but that's hard to interpret sometimes. It's hard to uh, evaluate if a design is good or bad based solely on stress. So with design life, is you can uh, apply the duty cycle data to convert that stress into fatigue. And now it's a lot easier to make a, an evaluation of design based on the fatigue life. So the thing about engineering, you can't really be a postmodern engineer. You have to deal with reality. So things like uh, campaign speeches, um, New Year's resolutions, budgets, those things exist outside of reality a lot of times. And you would hope your test and, and simulation group um, operate within reality, but unfortunately they sometimes cross the boundary. So combining both design life and glyph work allows for an effective relationship between simulation and test. So the analyzed data improves the FEA model. Um, usually you can't use raw test data directly. It needs to be processed. So Glyphworks is, can be used to get that ready for, uh, for FEA. And then a, F, a useful FEA model creates an effective test. So it tells you what to measure, where to measure, what to expect, where to place these transducers. Um, simulation works really well when you have a known failure. And what, what I mean is when you're operating in this overlap. So you have test data, or maybe you have a, a part that's falling off your machine. Um, the, that limit, that tells you how much complexity you need in your model. And then it gives you a target and a reality check. So if your part is falling off, you better expect high stress in, uh, in your FDA results. So the challenge is to move away from being always in this overlap and be able to work over here so you're not dependent on test data. All right, a little bit about this fan mount. So this is a, we've had this a similar design in production for uh, quite some time. The airflow uh, enters up to the top of the radiator and out the sides. Um, this is the, the part in question here. The, uh, the, the cooling fan is driven by a hydraulic motor and that's suspended here below and then the fans on top. And what happened with tier four is our cooling requirements increased so this cutout increased to uh, increase airflow. So this part had to expand, um, you know, for this wider uh, gap or this wider uh, hole. And then this this part got thinned up and notched out to uh, reduce the airflow restriction. So we call this the bow tie design. One of the electrical engineers thought it looked like a, a superhero mask, which goes to show you uh, all engineers are nerds, but some more than others. So the initial FDA, our design group followed our procedures and they requested FDA on this part. And being good FDA analysts, the first thing we tried to do was get out of it. We said, well, we've you know, never done this before. We don't know what load. So the first thing we, we decided, well, we have, our, we have standard uh, impact load. So let's do a static G loading. Um, so we did that, sent the results. 
uh, to the Zion group, and they said, well, thanks for that, but what does it mean? And we really couldn't answer it. I mean, the stress was sort of high, but below the ultimate and yield strength. Um, it's not a fatigue type load. We didn't really, uh, we couldn't really answer if this was acceptable or not. The next thing we looked at was the natural frequency. Um, we knew we have a track vibration around 30 hertz, and we, we knew we wanted to stay out of that range. And the first natural frequency was low. It was uh, around 30 hertz or so. Um, we went back to the design group. They made some iterations, some changes, but based on the designer constraints and manufacturing processes, we couldn't really shift that natural frequency much. So they pushed back on us, on the FDA group, and said, well, you know, is this acceptable? Is it going to stay out? And we couldn't answer that in FDA. So we went to test. Uh, we placed a single strain gauge based on the, the modal results, you know, the, the predicted hot spots and the stress. And <clears throat> we did a little bit of testing, and everything looked fine. Um, infinite life was the prediction. So we patted ourselves on the back for doing our due diligence and forgot about it. And we forgot about it until we started getting failed parts back from our proving grounds. Um, so we said we better take a closer look. So we slathered this component with strain gauges based on where we were seeing failures. And then we did our full, uh, what we call our customer usage profile. So our CUP is made up of individual duty cycles. Um, some of these duty cycles are fatigue type loading. So these are things that we expect the machine to do for thousands of hours. And some of them are extreme type loading. So this is something that is not going to happen very often, but we expect our machine to be able to do at least once. And the, again, the results came back. Everything was fine. We had very high life. In fact, some of these were, were infinite life. And then one duty cycle was low, but frankly, all our strain gauges are typically low. So this is a very extreme duty cycle. And <clears throat> based on our, uh, our criteria, this was acceptable. We would have said this design was acceptable if we didn't, if we hadn't had those uh, field failures. So we, we dug into the um, using GlyphWorks, dug into design or into the test data some more, to try to figure out what the load, what are the load cases? You know, what are we missing in FDA? Uh, so we did a lot of different things. Um, I think this kind of illustrates the the two load cases maybe the best. So we did a cross plot on uh, two of the gauges, two of the active gauges that had relatively high stress. And you can kind of see there's uh, some two trends here. And if you filter them, you can extract them maybe a little bit better. So you have a low frequency, you know, around one or two hertz, and then something around about 30 hertz. So we proposed uh, two different load cases. So at first I thought uh, this high stress load case was due to impact. So it was the machine is impacting. Um, we have an accelerometer on the drive on the fan motor, and I thought that fan motor was moving around, causing the stress. But we had poor correlation between the accelerometer and the strain gauge. So if we looked at the coherence, and or uh, if we looked at just doing the peak valley extraction and then doing a cross plot, they just didn't match up. So we determined this was due to the frame twisting, not the impact of the drive motor. So it had relatively high stress but low cycle time. And it's, not a, it's not a large part of the, of the customer profile or a large part of the proving ground data. Uh, the second load case, we had good correlation between accelerometer and strain gauge. Um, we, we determined that this was vibration related. Um, high cycle count is basically whenever the machine is moving, we have this load case, but this low stress. So we went to design life. Well, let's let's focus on this twisting load case since that seems to be the highest stress. So, design life matched reasonably well with some of the strain gauges, but we expected some high damage areas around around these mounting holes, and we just didn't see that. We also included part of the frame in this analysis, and that also had uh, um, had low damage, high life. So that forced us to go back to our test data, take another look at it. And we just determined that this was not the this was not the smoking gun. This was not the root cause. This was not the load case that was causing the damage. So we took a step, another step back, and went back to our FDA model. And maybe we're missing something in our FDA model. So there's a rubber gasket between the motor and the fan plate, and that is to prevent prevent vibration from the drive uh, from this motor 
um, causing noise to radiate from the fan plate. And this, this motor is held on with two bolts that are torqued to seven and a half foot pounds. And the idea of the low torque is to uh, you know, not short circuit the gasket. So I did a bolt pretension analysis, um, you know, basically having no gasket versus a rubber gasket. And we had considerably a uh, uh, considerable amount of stress in that pretension. So then we went to our vibration load case. Um, we created a vibration profile out of Glyphworks and then put this through Design Life. Um, so this is without the bolt pretension, and then this is with the bolt pretension. And now we were finally getting results where we expected. So these areas of low life were uh, where we were seeing field failures, and this this started to make sense. So to validate this, we came up with the vibration lab test. Now here's our lab test setup. Um, so we have supportion of the frame. You know, so here's our component that we're really trying to test: the motor, the fan. Again, we placed strain gauges, um, th and these are the results from that profile. And really expected low life on these gauges. So this is where we were having the crack, and this is where we measured the lowest stress. We actually measured the highest stress down here, where we never had any failures. And these gauges are zeroed out. So there's they're installed. The gauges are installed, this component was assembled, and then and then it's zeroed. So this, these are so this is the results from the lab test. Uh, they match really well with their field failures. So this is where it was cracking in the field. Um, you can see here here's some cracks, some secondary and prime well, some of these are secondary, some of these could have been primary. Um, and this this matched pretty well with, with design life. So this is what we had predicted in design life, and this is what we saw on our lab test, and this is what we saw in the field. And then I did do, uh, to, to verify that bolt preload, I installed the gauge, and then I measured the installation stress as I torqued these um, bolts up. So finally, um, based on this, we, uh, we came up with a new design. Our, our old design went six hours to failure on this uh, vibe test, test. And then our new design with the same profile uh, went 40 hours without failure before we stopped the test. So this is what we uh, predicted in design life, and then this is what we saw in the lab. So thank you for your time.